This video is brought to you by Devout Decals, makers of reusable Catholic art for your home altar, your bedroom, and your home classroom. If you've ever wondered when watching things going on in the world today, where people put out these random ideas, and all you can think about is, you know, that sounds great on paper, but have you ever actually thought about what would happen if you did that? Then, th then these two short pieces by Chesterton are for you. They're about, essentially, the lack of thoughtfulness. And most people don't really, well, think that much. They don't think about the consequences of what they do, of the ideas they have, and they don't take firm positions on anything. It's a strange thing to see happen, and we see it play out in, in the real world all the time. Just look at the state of things right now. A little note on Chesterton here. He goes after the, what I call the hammer and sickle uh, ideas. And he knows those rather intimately because when he was a young man, he had fallen into the error of the Fabian idea system. He was liberated from that when he discovered the writings of Pope Leo XIII in Catholic social teaching. And then he spent his life trying to correct the errors of the Fabians. So that's the context here for a lot of it. And uh, the Fabians are very should be very familiar to you because they are essentially very mainstream at this point. <laughs> so... Chesterton's words on this kind of thing are always relevant in our time. Anyway, I hope you find this helpful. The Blank State of the Modern Mind by G.K. Chesterton, published in April of 1926. I believe the world is at this moment in a most amazing state. I need not say that when I say the world, I mean that very minute and probably insignificant corner of the world which forms the educated society of which you and I are the sparkling ornaments. The great part of the world, which consists brief, chiefly of peasants, is quite different and may be relatively quite sane. But the world we know is in a strange state, even as compared with the world when first we knew it. Fifty years ago, twenty years ago, even ten years ago, a number of things existed of which the names still exist, but the things have totally disappeared. But the change, I mean, is something much too intimate to be concerned with institutions. It is concerned with the ideas that are behind institutions. Or rather, it is concerned with the absence of any ideas behind anything. I believe a new and enormous number of people now have no opinions at all. Some have open minds, some have empty minds, but few have the positive and partisan opinions that prevailed in my boyhood. A few have convictions. Indeed, there is some reasonable hope that the passing of opinions may be the coming of convictions. But most people have not yet got the convictions and have already lost the opinions. Often the opinions were little more than badges tied on like rosettes on boat race day, or but even on boat race day it would be disconcerting to see a whole crowd of men who had lost their badges and forgotten their favorite color. Indeed, the boat race is a very fair parallel to the party system, but that not only in its unreality but also in its reality. In both cases, a great mass of people really have no opinion of their own. But though what is called their opinion is at best a tradition, still it is the tradition of no opinion. There really are people who prefer Oxford to Cambridge. There really are seers and sages who believe they can predict which will win. So Oxford and Cambridge are different types of English ed education for the gentry. But there is a difference, and it might be a difference of opinion. A Whig of the type of Macaulay does obviously belong to Cambridge, a Tory of the type of Newman to Oxford. When, however, we see an errand boy hanging on behind a cart on boat race day, emblazoned with rosettes or loud with slogans, we shall err if we suppose him entirely moved by the Oxford movement if his rosette is dark, or steeped in the Cambridge modern history if it is light. We shall be mistaken in supposing that the clerk on a holiday, covered with streamers of the color of Cambridge, is saying proudly to himself, in the words of Macaulay, that Cambridge had the privilege of educating those whom Oxford had the privilege of burning. We shall be mistaken if we suppose that the hardy sporting gentleman in the light overcoat, who is so loudly backing Oxford, regards it tenderly as the home of lost causes. There is, or was, a real difference involved, but most of the people engaged in the dispute do not know the difference. It is not so much that it is about nothing, but rather that they know nothing about it. And as it was with the Whig and the Tory universities, so it was with the Whigs and Tories. Right at the back of the whole business there had once been an intelligible and intelligent argument between the two types of the English aristocracy in the 17th century. That ramified outwards in a hundred ways, in schools and systems and symbols and social festivals. Until the fringe of it was the ribboned rosette of the errand boy or the pink special edition of the tipster. Probably the outer ring kept up the tradition long after the inner ring had forgotten the true division. But there had been a true division. In a governing class that continued to inherit and hand on most of the wealth in the country, there was really one sort of man who thought mostly about inheriting it, and another who thought mostly about handing it on. 
The thoughts of one were pinned to loyalty in the past, the thoughts of the other to progress in the future, but of course were, both were excellent reasons for not breaking the entail. After these aristocrats came a crowd of vassals and partisans, and after them a vast mob of hangers-on, wearing rosettes and going to see the boat race. Now, when I say people have lost their opinions, I mean this, that the outer ring has discovered that the inner ring is indifferent, or possibly that the inner ring does not exist. The individuals inside are thinking as individuals, the mob outside are ceasing to think as mobs, certainly ceasing to think as armies. The man in the know only knows that he knows nothing. He is no longer certain either that progress is a good thing or that tradition is a good thing. And the man outside has fallen into a confusion like that of a reveler on boat race day, who should have reached the stage of saying, in an answer to constabulary questions, that he had always been Oxford or Camford. In some ways it may well be said that this blank state of mind is a better thing than the prejudices and blatant slanders of the past, and up to a point, doubtless, it is a good thing. But there is a further difficulty which I do not think is very well understood. Not only have men lost their opinions, but many of them seem to have lost the power of forming opinions. They have seen all there is to be seen of the last stages of beliefs, but they do not seem even able to imagine what the beginning of a belief would be like. They seem to think there is something archaic and antediluvian about the first acts of the mind, by which it opens the open question of the world. It seems a mere mad negation to start from scratch. It seems a barbaric fantasy to begin at the beginning. They no more employ first principles than flint arrows and regard the first proposition of Euclid as a Paleolithic drawing on a rock. They would almost as soon rebuild all our elaborate and toppling cities of civilization all over again from their first foundations, as really dig up one of their own reasons for one of their own opinions. Easter, which is the spiritual new year, should be a time for the understanding of new thoughts and the making of new things. The representatives of the rising generation can give us any number of negative reasons for not observing certain forms or traditions. They do not seem to see that it is their business as artists to create forms. They will not realize that it is their business as builders to found traditions. If the old conventions have really come to an end, the others have to do something much more difficult. They have to come up to a beginning. I doubt if they have any clear idea about how to come to a beginning. They do not understand that positive creations are founded on positive creeds. To touch but lightly upon the great mystery that is most involved in the idea of Easter, we have seen lately a lively curiosity revolving around the ancient idea of the return of the dead. Perhaps it should be called the great and glorious doubt about whether the dead are dead. When that doubt came to trouble a generation of materialists, it naturally turned many of them into spiritualists. The spiritualist is nearly always converted materialist. He is seldom or never a natural mystic. For most of these men, it was enough of a revelation that any light of any sort gleamed through cracks of the door of death, which they had assumed to be blank wall at the end of the blind alley. The result of the on the mass of their sympathizers or semi-sympathizers was something very like what I have suggested as the attitude of the man staring with a blank face at the blue rosette. It is not so much the condition of having discovered something as of being ready for anything. It is not so much that most modern people have found a faith to set against the materialists, it's simply that they have lost faith in materialism. The skeptic is sure of nothing now, not even of his five senses. It is not so much a new vision as a new void to be filled with visions. And this is no place in which to argue about what the visions shall be. And I think what will pair nicely with that is this essay, published about three weeks beforehand in the London Weekly News. It's called Being Bored with Ideas. Many people are now supposed to be saying that the rising generation is really a sinking generation. I cannot quote many public examples, because I notice that the newspapers and magazines, curiously enough, are much more concerned with printing answers to this charge than with printing the charge itself, or even telling us where it has been printed. I have read half a hundred defenses of the modern girl against attack, and I have never read the attack. I cannot therefore answer for whether it was reasonable or unreasonable. But so far as the problem does exist for all of us, there is one point about it upon which I am cert very certain indeed. I am sure that, in so far as there is any sort of social breakdown, it is not so much a moral breakdown as a mental breakdown. It is much more like a softening of the brain than a hardening of the heart. What does seem to me to have slackened or weakened is not so much the connection between conscience and conduct, clearly approved by conscience, as a connection between any two ideas that could enable anybody to see anything clearly at all. It is not a question of free thought, but of free thoughtlessness. The difficulty is not so much to get people to follow a commandment as to get them even to follow an argument. It seems to tire their heads like a game of chess when they are in the mood for a game of tennis. And in truth, their philosophy does seem to be rather like a game of tennis, with the motto of love all. But it will be noticed that the rules of tennis are really rather more arbitrary than the rules of chess. 
only while they claim the same obedience they are easier to obey. It seems to me that this modern mood does not mind anything being arbitrary, so long as it is also easy. It does not inquire into the authority or even the origin of any order which it has come to regard as ordinary. It only asks to move smoothly along the grooves that have been graven for it by unknown and nameless powers, such as the powers that organize the tubes or the trams. It does not object to ruts if they are also rails. It does indeed wish to be comfortable, and will sometimes abandon convention for the sake of comfort, but it seems to me that this generation has rather less than its fathers and grandfathers of the special sort of discomfort that used to be called divine discontent. Divine discontent of the older sort was disposed to drive its questions backwards against the movement of existence, and discover the cause of things. The old abstract revolutionist would have had the startifying audacity to ask who it is who really runs the trams or controls the tubes. Most of the young rebels of today are content to ask whether they will not soon be made a little bigger or a little quicker or a little more convenient. In other words, the individual has indeed a certain kind of independence, but I am not sure that it is the kind of independence which requires most intelligence. I notice, for instance, that these people are always thinking of more or less new notions, and never thinking them out. Their novels and newspapers are full of suggestions and of assumptions, but not of opinions. I mean opinions in the sense that I used to have opinions when I was an exceedingly opinionated young man. We always wanted to state our doctrines in a dogmatic fashion, and state them completely, so as to show that they were so complete. We wanted to prove to Uncle Humphrey that the hammer and sickle was unanswerable, and challenge him to answer it. We wanted to spread the whole fa fabric of Fabianism before the horrific eyes of Aunt Susan and defy her to pick a hole in it. It is not exactly in that fashion that the new heresies are suggested by the new generation. It is rather in the way of certain phrases often uncompleted phrases, which slip out in a way which we cannot help thinking slipshod. If they were stated in a clear fashion, they would very probably startle the people who hold them. Suppose, for instance, I were to state one of them thus, that a human being had an abstract right to gratify curiosity, the form of it would appear to the younger generation unfamiliar through being formal, but that is what is logically implied in half a hundred Ill illusions and episodes and comments in fashionable fiction and journalism. Christine Alberta, of whom I wrote last week, says openly that she has broken one of the commandments to gratify her curiosity, and she and her friends do not seem to think very much of it, except as a piece of mildly interesting self-analysis. But though in a sense she is willing to analyze herself, it never occurs to her to analyze her theory. It never occurs to her to ask whether it is a tenable or tolerable principle, as a principle that anybody may do anything merely because he or she has never done it before. It does not seem to strike any of those who talk in this way that the argument, as an argument, could be extended quite as easily to all the other Ten Commandments, or to those things which the modern rebel respects so much more than the Ten Commandments, the police regulations or the bylaws of the factory and the shop. It would be as easy to use it of burglary or murder as of the ethical experiments to which they are so fond of applying it. The young person might say, I was devoured with curiosity about what it really feels like to be unscrewing somebody else's safe in the middle of the night. The rising generation might cry aloud, what I wanted was experience, the thrill of a tense and novel experience of extracting somebody else's purse or pocket handkerchief from somebody else's pocket. They might go on and apply the principle to the ending of life, to human sacrifice, to anything. As we know, two American elder brothers of ours, while they were still schoolboys, did actually embody this ideal for the rising generation. I am not saying that the rising generation are the, those who take life, but that they are muddle-headed people. In other words, they are people who do not really know why they are not the kinds of people who take life. They are people who can give no clear and consistent account of themselves, no reasonable excuse for not being that way. It is in the faint but friendly hope of clearing up for them this mystery about themselves, this dark and inscrutable absence of that from their lives, that I venture to make this criticism of their views. This is what I mean by saying that the only thing that has broken down in them is the intellectual connection of ideas. Or take another idea or rather fragment of an idea. It is suggested, suggested in the same hazy and half-hearted fashion that every individual should be independent, and that this applies even to the very young individual. The schoolboy, the schoolgirl, the infant in the infant school, and almost the infant in arms are all to be regarded as individuals. It is constantly repeated that they are all to be regarded as citizens, but it never seems to occur to anybody to make the next and most obvious inference, to take the next step in the argument. Nobody suggests that they should assert their independence by being independent. Nobody points out that if the father and the child are only two citizens, 
There is no more reason for asking the father to support the child than the child to support the father. The mother and the baby are both independent and individuals. The mother must be as independent of the baby as the baby of the mother. The mother must be free to say, I do not like this individual, and throw the baby out the window. Why should one citizen sponge on another citizen from the age of two to the age of twenty? Why should he or she contract this curious obligation in a world where all are equal? Now the new, the new innovators do not denounce the obligation. They do not deny it. They do not propose a definite substitute for it. They have no new theory about the relation of parent and child. They simply assume the obligation, and then ignore the obligation. They take it for granted that the young person must live on the old person as long as he chooses, and then defy the old person as soon as he likes. This may be a rebellious mood, but it is not a new idea. It is a mood of a person who is merely bored with all ideas, whether innovative or not. Hope you found that entertaining this weekend. And I think this is, these two essays of his are something to consider when we look at the state of everything in the world today, the state of the church, and everything else. Because another thing is that, again, as he says at the end, these are not new ideas. The state of the church is not filled with new problems. Remember, modernism is the synthesis of all heresies, meaning what we're seeing are old, bad ideas repackaged and brought again in the church today. And so, go, so it is also in the world. So why don't you let me know what you thought about all that in the comments, please. And uh, like and subscribe if you haven't. It does help. As always, pray for the church. I'm Anthony Stein. Ave Maria.